So power words, part one, the fear of the Lord. Uh, John, will you go ahead and pray this prayer at the top? Sure. Uh, pray based on Ephesians 1, to, uh, 117 to 19 and Psalms 1, 1918. Father, we pray that you impart to us the riches of the spirit wisdom and spirit revelation to know you through our deepening intimacy with you. We pray that the light of God would illuminate the eyes of our Im Im imagination flooding us with light until we experience the full revelation of the hope of your calling. That is the wealth of your glorious inheritance that you find that we uh, you find in us, your holy ones. I pray that we will continually experience the immeasurable greatness. Your power may available to us through faith. Open our eyes, Father, that we may see wonders, things from your law, from your word. Amen. Amen. So last week we finished up First Thessalonians, and I had thought to continue through Second Thessalonians. I thought we would, but um, I believe the Lord has a different direction for us for a while. I do hope that He eventually lets us get back on to Second Thessalonians and wrap that up. So. Anyways, I was thinking about the direction to take for this week. A title of one of Kevin's and I's books kept coming to mind, and that is the mystery of the power words. These words can be understood as words that the devil fears and Christians should use often. This was actually the theme of the first conference that, we, that he held in Waikiki a year. It might have been a year and a half, over two years ago. I'm not sure how long it was. Anyway, um, I expect that this series will be several weeks long. And um, some of the general order of this series is inspired by Kevin's die in that book. But I aim to hope to uh, minimize direct quotes from him. And uh, any, any direct quotes, oh, I will um, make sure to notate. Uh, I'll try to anyway. Sometimes I forget. Oh, I went too far. <clears throat> so anyway, we all know that words are very important. Words set definitions and understanding and communicate concepts and truths and agendas and mindsets and really fill in what would other be a blank space in our everyday lives. More words are being invented all the time to explain and define new findings in science and technology. Some words are being made obsolete because they don't fit in anymore and are found to be or are found to be inconvenient or offensive to some groups. And some words have been given whole new meanings to fit a particular culture or pop culture. Uh, so just uh, for fun, what can you think of a word that has taken on a new meaning for a group or pop culture? It doesn't have to be just this year. Or this, Is that Grady? Yeah. Hi, Grady. Uh, bad. What did you say? Bad? Bad. Is that a popular group? No, it's just a word. It's like bad used to mean bad, but uh, then it turned into meaning good. Oh, you're right. Uh, you're right. <laughs> it's just like the word sick. Sick used to mean, okay, you're not feeling well, but then it became, it also became meaning like, oh, this is, this is a really awesome thing. Wow, that's sick. Right. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> w w wicked is another one of those words people say that's wicked and I'm like oh why would you want that and then that really meant that's cool and that's awesome I'm like well so yeah so words the uh, words get changed all the time um, we used to use the word cool all the time but it didn't mean that it was cold outside it meant that it was cool <laughs> you know so um, words words can be fun and groovy groovy yeah and um even watching some of those old 1932 movies they say some words like swell and, uh, well i remember you know when i was a kid watching some of the black and whites with the dennis menace or whoever they would use the word swell quite a bit 
And I think they even did it in the happy days, maybe. So anyway, the swell doesn't mean that it's really cool. Uh, recently, it means like a swell in the water, whatever. So anyway, um, words are fun, can be pretty cool, and can be not pretty cool. Out of sight, man. Out of sight, far out. Far out and out of sight. <laughs> You know what generation we grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> the 70s. So in the Bible, there are certain power words or combinations of words that are full of potential energy or power that when spoken in faith have tremendous kinetic energy. I don't know why I use those words, but I did. Have tremendous kinetic energy or power that makes things happen. These are words that when spoken in faith and intent, destroy the enemy's strongholds in people's hearts and minds. All these words that we will be spending time with over the next few weeks are words or phrases we're all familiar with, but are words that in many of today's churches have fallen into disuse because they can be offensive to a seeker-friendly audience and challenge a humanistic view of the desires of the flesh and the world. And so a lot of churches there, they are, they seem to be less interested in the souls of the people than they are in the numbers of the people. And so which numbers generally mean money. And that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So Jesus is a word. Vicki, can you read that? John 1, 1. Yes, the word was in the beginning. And that very word was with God, and God was that word. Jesus is the eternal word of God that has put on flesh. Every word or phrase or combination of words we find in the Bible brings us revelation of who God is and what he's like and what he thinks about things. When we attack the word of God, we attack Jesus. When we decide it is inconvenient to use certain words and phrases out of the Bible, then we have decided that certain aspects of God are inconvenient and so are better left unsaid. So as not to offend or challenge anyone. Amen. Wow. Is that a mouthful? Well, it kind of got confirmed when we were watching Kevin Sedai tonight yeah, after he wrote this. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote this, and then we settled down for a while and watched uh, about an hour, hour and a half of Kevin's and I, and, and a number of the things that I touch on in this lesson are the very same things he said in that uh, conference and wherever he's at. The Lord had a talk with him and told him he needed to address some things and say some hard things to the people that uh, he would be held accountable for uh, speaking these uh, truths out to people so he did it it's a good leader didn't he go to heaven didn't he had a yes. vision of the lord yeah he died on the died in oral surgery oh. and he was gone for 45 minutes 43 or 45 minutes wow so uh, if you haven't read any of his stuff or listened to him i encourage you to he brings a lot of um a lot of uh, understanding, a lot of fresh revelation. He uh, really has a way of of uh, dismantling some of the attitudes and mindsets people have just because they have them. And so I really appreciate uh, what he's what he's got to say. And uh, you know, the Lord is blessing him, right? Paul said, "Okay." I, I listen to him uh, sometimes on um, YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's good. And um, he's come to Honolulu a couple times. We've gone to a couple conferences with him here. Oh, nice! And the presence of the Lord is amazing. Nice, it's really, really nice meetings. And I hope in the future I uh, uh, do some conference in uh, Hawaii. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, okay, um, only uh, dream, right? <laughs> Susie, can you read this uh, next little bit? Under some words are hard to understand. Admittedly, some words and phrases and concepts we find in the Bible that can be difficult to wrap our minds around, but that is intent for Jesus and said in John 6, 6, 3, it is a spirit that gives life. The body is of no account, 
The words which I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Amen. And then Mary Lou, can you read these two verses under what Paul, and Paul says. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14, and this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand him because they are spiritually discerned. Amen. Thank you, Mary Lou. So uh, the spirit gives understanding. The word of God is meant to be understood by the inner man of the heart, by the spirit of man first, and then by the natural mind as our natural man, as our souls or minds are transformed. Jesus and the religious leaders of the day were at odds on almost everything. The religious leaders took the word of God at face value and then added their own twists and extra laws to keep the people under their thumbs. And then Jesus comes along bringing the truth, the intent of the word of God, and brings people life and freedom. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The very same word of God that brings condemnation and death when viewed through the lens of the natural man brings life when viewed through the lens of the spirit who inspired it. These power words are words that might appear to be out of touch with today's world or offensive to some or don't fit our contemporary view of Christianity. The temptation is to ignore and not talk about or use the words that make us uncomfortable or that we don't grasp easily. But those are the very words we need to meditate on and let the Spirit of God, who is our teacher, bring us revelation into these truths. So question, who brings life through the Word? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is the one that brings life. And, um, you know, I've said this before, but but when I read the word, I mean, I'm reading stuff that I've read dozens and hundreds of times, and some maybe even more than that over the years. And I'm reading this stuff, and it's like, this is good. This is so good. I mean, it's just like fresh, it's like fresh manna, fresh, fresh bread. As I'm reading this, I'm seeing stuff I didn't see before, or or if I saw it before, you know, it didn't sink real deep. Now when I'm reading, I'm going, oh my gosh, this is good. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Because it's the spirit of God that's talking to me um, about his word, about what he's saying, about his intent in the word of God. Oh, can I ask you, um, you, uh, the, uh, you were reading, said the, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It's not talking about the, the letter or the, the word of God? Yes. When it's the law, it's... Um... The written word and the, and the law has no life in it, but when you have the Holy Spirit be your teacher and um, give you revelation about the word, then that's what makes it the living word. That's what makes it come alive for you. Okay. Because when you do just the word without the spirit, mm -hmm. um, it can bring a lot of uh, condemnation and hopelessness to people. So you have to have the word and the spirit. Okay. Because I always thought the word of God is life. I didn't think it would kill. Right. But uh, we all, we've probably all been there either probably on the receiving end and on the uh, delivering end of clubbing people over the head with the word of God, bringing condemnation. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is bringing death. Where that same word, when it's under the unction of the Holy Spirit, will bring life and peace and freedom. So it's like the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the Dead Sea um, doesn't have a place for the water to run out. And so it just gets saltier and saltier and saltier and no fish can live in it or anything. And that's why they call the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that's where they found them in that area. But you get uh, running water, the river of God, where the water is fresh and flowing. 
then there's life in it and there's fish in it. And, uh, and so you have to have the living water, like Jesus talked about at the well with the woman in the New Testament. He said, you should have asked me for a drink and I would have given you living water. And you would have never thirst again because it'd be a wellspring inside of her continuously. So we have to have the word and the spirit. So the spirit can teach us about the word. Amen. Good word, Vicki. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the first of the power words we're going to look at is the fear of the Lord. The mention of the fear of the Lord or the fear of God is found close to 170 times, more or less 170 times throughout the Bible um, by dozens of writers. It's not all just one or two writers, it's by dozens of writers, many of the books. The Bible tells us that a matter can be established by two or three witnesses. So for a subject to be covered by dozens of witnesses means that it is of utmost importance. And we'll just show a few verses by several different authors. Um, Todd, can you go ahead and, and uh, I guess, go ahead and read down to Revelation from uh, Solomon here, down to Revelation, down to John Revelation here. Okay, Solomon wrote Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In Psalms 19.9, David wrote, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, being altogether righteous. In Luke 12, 4, Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, and, and after that can do no more. And all, and Luke, 12 5 but i will show you whom you should fear fear the one who after you have been killed has authority to throw you into hell yes i tell you fear him and luke in acts 9 31 says when the church throughout judea galilee and samaria experienced a time of peace it grew in strength and numbers living in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. John wrote in Revelation 19.5, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you who serve him, and those who fear him, small and great alike. Thank you, Todd. So there are, there are literally dozens of scriptures uh, telling us to fear God, and fear the Lord, and talking about the fear of the Lord. I mean, there's many, many, many scriptures in there. It's not a new concept, and, and but it's an eternal concept. Um, people have tried to explain away what the fear of love is, the fear of the Lord is, because they want a nice God. They want a God they can take or leave. They want a God that they can believe or not believe. And they want a God that they can trust or not trust. They want a God that is optional and that there is no consequence if they don't believe him or obey him because a nice God would never send anyone to hell. <clears throat> we like the definition that the fear of the Lord is a childlike reverence and awe of God, which is true, but is also much more. The fear of the Lord also has to do with terror or that which causes flight or fleeing from his presence. And I didn't pull up all those scriptures, but you know, we have we have scriptures that says that the the mountains will melt before the presence of the Lord, and the earth trembles at the presence of the Lord. And so if we really if we really got too close to the to the the whole of who God is, not just the you know experience with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but if we really got too close to the to the reality of, of, you know, the wholeness of God, we would be baked, we would be turned to dust. We could never, never, never in our own selves, in our own strength, in our own goodness, uh, stand in that. And the only way that we can stand before the Lord is, is by virtue of the blood of the cross. 
and mm -hmm. our and our commitment to the to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, Pastor, also the fear of the Lord means you obey Him, right? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. When you fear Him, you obey Him. Yes. Yes. And yeah. and okay. and we have, yeah, and we have the same holiness inside us. Yes. We have the holiness from Him. And in Isaiah eleven two, it talks about the seven spirits of God, and the one, the last one listed is the spirit of the spirit fear of, of the, the Lord. Spirit of the the spirit yeah. of the fear of the Lord. So it's it's a very, very basic, very basic part of God. But but a lot of places never talk about the fear of the Lord. And I don't know yeah. when I've actually heard a sermon other than Kevin's that I touched on it. Um, I don't know when I've actually heard a sermon or the preacher's been preaching on the fear of the Lord. Yeah. You know, so it's not a popular subject because it makes people squirm and it makes people uncomfortable, right? You know, God straightened me out uh, when I was 18 and a half about fearing him because I was very disrespectful to him. I had become born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit at 16 and I was still in high school. And it came a time where I wanted to go party with my friends again. So I actually said to the Lord out loud, I said, um, I'm going to go do my own thing for a while and I'll get back to you later. <laughs> wow. I mean, no fear of God at all. But everything I did, uh, I hit a brick wall, you know, nothing was going well at all. So after a while, I, I decided, you know, I, I just need to go back to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I started to pray, read my Bible, and, you know, it was like my prayers were hitting the ceiling and not getting through. And I had had a connection with God, you know. When I got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was an amazingly real thing that uh, just lit up my world, you know. And I was connected to him, and I could hear him, and I had fellowship with him. But I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't break through a barrier. And so I read some scriptures like uh, it's a dreadful thing to fall in the, into the hands of the living God. And uh, you could taste uh, the good things of the Lord and then there's no more sacrifice for sins if you tasted the good things of the Lord and walked away. And I'm like, oh my God, I crossed a line. Hmm. I am out of the picture. He's not taking me back and I'm just going to end up in hell someday. And I kept praying and uh, reading my Bible, and it really did take two months. And then I got breakthrough, and I felt his spirit inside me again. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, why did you take so long? And he said, because I'm holy, and you treated me as an unholy thing. Mm -hmm. And that really uh I, I i took them very seriously and i never backslidden again since i was 18 and a half <laughs> and i'm 68 now <laughs> wow that's amazing yeah uh, you know, um I, I know church that i used to go to they don't fear the lord they treat him as a genie you right. have three wishes what do you want like to like <laughs> I, come to him for blessing Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. I need this, and that's that's it. They they go their way. They do what they want. So there's no fear there, and the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, right? If we don't hate evil, that means we don't fear Him, right? That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Some people um, they fear God, and they prefer to you know fear itself. You know that you know. More often for me, I think it's more like a sense of awe or yeah. submission to God. Yeah. Um, people subscribe to the popular religions, you know, for instance, um, they can fear hell or divine judgment, but um, who they're submitting to, sometimes they don't even know. Um, in, in Revelation 14, it says, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. 
worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of water. Okay, this was this verse itself was so important that they put it on a medical uh, on a metal plaque in a stone boulder in in a viewpoint in Hawksford Road in Baladon. And you know, so sometimes I think people look at God in fearing him, but they use him as a show sh shopping list. You know, he's right. I want this, I want that. You know, he's a grocery store. And so they're not afraid of a grocery store. You know, they don't have the common sense yeah. <laughs> that, you know, God can cause devastation, but he's also a God of love. Yeah. But if you're going against God, you can lose the blessings that he has. And, you know, my desire has always been, you know, that when I die, that he looks at me and says, this is my daughter and who I am well pleased. And I know I fall short of that because most of us do. But I think a lot of people don't know what it means to fear God. Amen. I pray. And uh, just respect him because he is holy. Yeah. And he gave everything for us, you know, to be able to yeah. be yeah. forgiven and have a relationship with him and have eternal life. And we really need to give him the honor and yeah. the glory and the respect uh, that he deserves. You know, and it has been my heart since that time that people would recognize Jesus for who he is and what he's done and give him that honor and recognition of who he is. I really want people to know him and to give him glory for what he's Amen. done. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of us work for, for um, people or work for big, big businesses. And you would not think if you, if you valued your job at all, you would never think to disrespect the president of the company that decided to come do a walkthrough and, and see how things are doing in the plant for the business. Yeah. You would never want to, you would want to um, be honorable and respectful yeah. and all that. You would never think of, of uh, just kind of, well, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't really respect them. I don't care who you are because, because um, you know, whatever. You never do that. Um, for fear of losing your job but we just dis people we disrespect god all the time and of course we're not walking uh, we're not on a razor edge walking a tightrope for the lord but at the same time um you know and i touched on this a little bit this next section here familiarity breeds contempt so lucifer we've all heard the phrase familiarity breeds contempt i think so Lucifer was the covering cherub. He was one of the highest, if not the highest, ranking being in heaven. But he lost the fear of the Lord and aspired to replace him. And he led a rebellion, and consequently, he lost his position in heaven. Adam and Eve walked with God in the Garden of Eden, Eden and then lost the fear of the Lord and disobeyed the only command they were given. And consequently, they lost everything. Many people today view God as their main man or the best friend and the like, and which he is. Holy Spirit is our best friend, right? But he's so much more. The sense of familiarity without maintaining the fear of the Lord opens us up to all sorts of trouble and an attitude that leads to believing obedience is optional. And that's where you were talking about earlier, John, is, is a fear of obedience, is a fear of the Lord is obedience or something like that, right? Obedience to the Lord is not optional. When the Lord tells us to do something, we best do it, right? Um, Grady, can you go ahead and read these about with the price, these two verses? First Corinthians 6. 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Thank you, Brady. So what was the price? His life. The blood of Jesus Christ, right? Look. The life, 
blood of Jesus Christ was the price paid for us. So when we took Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we gave him our lives. We said, Lord, I, I you know, I, I ask him to be my Lord, my Savior. So everything in us became his. And at the same time, we inherited everything that God is. Right? We can now understand that holiness, which so we know holiness or sanctification is separation under the, under the Lord. Now we to separate something under the Lord. So now we can, since, since we belong to God, we know that we're bought with Christ, we can now understand that holiness is equated to ownership and walking accordingly. Right? So, so if, if, uh, if I belong to God and to walk in holiness, since he owns me, to walk in holiness is going to be walk in, walking in a way that honors him. Our lives are not our own, so we now live separated from the dictates and demands of the world from which we have come out of. Without holiness, the Bible says, no one will see God. Does not mean that we are following all the rules to, to please God, but it means that we live from the place of being in Christ, separated from the world. It doesn't mean we never make a mistake, but it does mean that when we do, we humble ourselves and fess up and get to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace. And does anybody have any comments on, on that last section we just read? Well, I, I know that uh, my motivation more than um, maybe being afraid of him or, uh, you know, I don't want to to disappoint him or, or uh, displease him, but it, it really is all based on because I love, I love him. Amen. And Amen. Nobody, nobody else has died for me. Amen. Nobody else gave their life for me like he did. And um, so I, I, you know, he says uh, in First Corinthians 13, if we do all these things, but we don't do them out of love, it's for nothing. Yes. Amen. So uh, I, I don't do it for acceptance or to get his approval because I already have that. Yeah. I, I do it because I appreciate him and I love him. And I, and I want to love him back. You know, that's what he really wants. He, yeah. he loves yes. us and he wants us to love him back. And he says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you Amen. love me, you'll yes. believe me. But believing him is his love language. When he tells yes. us something, he wants us to take him at his word and believe him. Yes. You know, and so um, I'm not afraid of him, but I did discover through my experience that he's holding mm. and you just you don't play around with that he's holy you know yeah. so i did get the fear of the lord in a real healthy way it's not made me afraid of him it's just increased my respect for him and not to take him for granted what he's done for me amen amen yeah, I totally agree. Um, uh, Paul said uh, he's compelled, the love of God compels him, and we love him because he first loved us. So he, we know how much he loves us. We return that favor, want to please him. And uh, yeah, he, he is love. Um, so yeah, like you said, um, you know, we, when we uh, love him, then we would obey him. We would obey him, and we would trust him. Faith works through love. We know he loves us. We would trust him. And it's a relationship. It's a love relationship. It's not uh, like be afraid of him, like you said, but to honor him and to want to please him. And when you say love. obey him, I think about, you know, it's just having a cooperative spirit with the Lord to cooperate with him. Well, it's yeah. when we trust him because we know his great love for us and what he's done yeah. for us. We trust him. And yeah. you, won't, you won't cooperate with someone that you don't trust. And so that's why yeah. it's really important that we really do get to know him up close and personal through his word mm -hmm. and through the spirit. 
and uh, his character, his divine nature, and his heart toward us, because then we trust him, and then we're going to be obedient. We're going to cooperate with him because Amen. Amen. we know we know that he has our best at, at heart for everything that he asks us to do. Amen. Amen. That, that that's what I need to learn more to trust him more. That's what I need to learn. That's good. You're on the right track, brother. Um, <laughs> John, could you go ahead and uh, read uh, All Things Are Lawful, those two verses? Okay, All Things Are Lawful, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Everything is lawful for me, but not everything is expedient. Everything is lawful for me, but not, but everything does not edify. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. But let no man seek for himself alone, but every man seek for his neighbor also. So, uh, just a heads up, we're not going to go down a rabbit hole here. This is a passage that will cause people to go down a rabbit hole and make their heads spin um, sometimes um, because they, they, they misunderstand um, that we have been, uh, that the law is no longer, you know, it's no longer against us. So believers often have trouble with verse 23, all things, which means all things are lawful for me. That means that there is no law remaining that says something is forbidden. Okay. At the same time, he says that not all things are expedient or not all things edify. That means that not all things are good for my fellow man or for myself. So whatever I do should be done for my neighbor's good. Amen. This fulfills the royal law of love. In my freedom from the written ordinances of the law, I choose to walk in love for your good rather than using my freedom to gratify the flesh. Amen. Like, so, say that there's, there's a difference between all things are lawful and, and saying that there's no such thing as sin. Yeah. That sin is... It's like if one sins, it's not the old law condemning you. It's it's still a sin, but it's the consequences being separated from God rather than because the old law said so. Right. So, that, so, it's, it's, so the old the old code is not held against us. Now the laws are laws of God are written on written on our hearts. Right. They're written in our hearts. Yeah. But um, so my question on this um, is how does the fear of the Lord apply in this section we just read here? Um, uh, we take him at his word and we obey. Okay, we take him at his word and we obey him. Okay. And and I, I like when uh says all things are lawful, but not everything edify. Like I, I could be watching a lot of TV. It's not a sin, but it doesn't edify me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And we're to seek uh, other people's good other than ours. Because right. we're blessed to be a blessing. We're here to be a blessing. Like put other people ahead of our need, ahead of us. We're to serve. So we had some we have some friends that that um, we got in kind of a lengthy conversation debate here one night. Um, they went out for Mexican food and and he just drinks water, I think, and, and she had some she had a mixed drink, and um, which she has freedom to do, right? All things are lawful, but <clears throat> but. Um, what we got spinning around is is that is that in a very real sense we are our brother's keeper yeah so if my exercise of the freedom the blood-bought freedom that i have in christ if my exercise of that freedom um causes my neighbor to stumble or as a potential of putting a stumbling block in front of them then I have fallen out of the royal law of love and I'm just fulfilling the deeds of my flesh. 
<clears throat> like Paul says in Romans, it's in Romans, where he says about uh, if, if eating eating meat that's not a sin, but if if an uh, unbeliever sees it that believes who still believes it's a sin, you're kind of doing something in their sight that is going to confuse them and. And that, that could be a, a stumbling block and, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah, a, a weaker brother, whatever. Yeah, so, so, for, <clears throat> so for many years, my dad drank alcohol after I was a believer, but I would never drive down to the store and buy him beer. Because I didn't want anybody to be watching me buy a beer thinking that I'm saying, it's okay to go out and get drunk. You know, it's okay to drive drunk and all that. And I didn't want to communicate that to them and give and and communicate, you know, the wrong message. <clears throat> they wouldn't know that it was for my dad unless I told them. Then they'd think, yeah, right, you're just making an excuse. Um, so so for us to walk in love, fulfill the royal law of love, even though all things are lawful for me, there's things we're just not going to do, and there are places we're just there's just things we're not going to do, right? And there's conversations we're not going to have. Even though our flesh is screaming to gossip, there's conversations we're not going to have because that conversation uh, could be a stumbling block for somebody or whatever, right? So you know, I don't want to, and I'm not, I don't want to get anybody all caught up in the bondage of the law because that's not what we're doing. We're walking in freedom. But as I was saying, in our exercise of freedom, <clears throat> we don't want to be a stumbling block. We don't want to be a stumbling block. Yeah. My friend uh, was a Sunday school teacher. And she was out in public having pizza with her family. And she loved to have a beer with her pizza. So she had a beer in front of her. And a young family came into the restaurant with their children that she was teaching at our church in Sunday school. And she felt horrible. She felt like she's not a good example. And so she decided that she wasn't going to do that anymore. Um, because she didn't want to be a stumbling block to those little kids or to the young parents. So it's just wisdom, you know. Uh, we don't want to, to uh, you know, somebody else too. We may not have a problem with alcohol, with alcoholism, but maybe somebody else does. And they think, well, Pastor Keith and Pastor Vicky have a glass of wine with dinner, so I, it's okay if I do, but maybe that wouldn't be good for them to have that, you know, and I haven't had a drink of alcohol in 29 years and Keith hasn't probably in 40, I don't know, 41, 41 years. So uh, before we even knew each other, we already had come to that place. The Holy Spirit had talked to me, uh, I was about 38, 39 years old and he said, um, he, and I know he doesn't say this to everybody, but he said to me, for you, Vicki, you have a choice. You can have the alcohol or the Holy Spirit, but you can't have both. And I said, I choose the Holy Spirit. So. Right. So we're not, um, I don't condemn believers drinking wine or, or beer, um, although they shouldn't be getting drunk um, because that leads to other things, dissipation. But um, we just want to be a good witness, right? We just don't want to be a stumbling block in front of somebody in the exercise of our freedom. And I feel like I've kind of worn that statement out. But um, <clears throat> anyway. Can I say something? Yeah. When, you, when you're out someplace and you see somebody that's drunk, you know, you, you look at them and you judge them for the drunkenness. When you see someone who's smoking cigarettes and they they're surrounded with smoke, you know that you know it's like oh my god I can't breathe. You know you 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 condemn them and you do this, but you know at the same time they have the right to do this. They have you know the power to you know say no, but at the same time people don't look at what they're presenting. You know, if we're the body of Christ, we want to present the body of Christ. And when you're drinking and when you're smoking and you're partying and, you know, uh, 
I can't say the word when when you're messing around and stuff like that. It's the persona that you're showing others is not a witness for God. And but we we do it all the time in everyday life. You know, you see a kid pick up something, they're stealing it. You see the mama take something off the shop in the grocery store and hand it to the kid. I see this all the time. It's the walk of life that they're not doing, meaning that they don't have the life of God within them. Right. They've chosen this. They don't have the godliness. And the worst part about this is they're missing the mark. And they've chosen this lifestyle and they're losing the blessings of God. You know, and, and it's it's sad, it's it really is, but you know, it's nothing wrong with drinking. God, you know, made water into wine, but it's the drunkenness and it's the lifestyle, it's what your people are perceiving and what you're showing the world, I think that is more important, you know, in this aspect of witnessing that, you know, it you know, it's it's hard to describe what stumbling blocks that you may be causing somebody else. Right. And so, I, hate, I hate it when somebody comes up to me and they put their arms around me and they, they're trying to love all over you and they're drunk. You know, it's uh, like, ooh, you know? Yeah, very unpleasant. So, so uh, what you're saying, Susie, um, so a long, long time ago, um, 40, I'm going to say 42, 43 years ago, I was very backslid and I had started drinking again. And I remember, I think it was, it was probably some afternoon or some evening and in a bar in Centuria, Washington, I think it's El Rancho and I'm getting drunk and I think I was shooting pool and somebody that I had known before, probably somebody I'd witnessed to said, I thought you were a Christian. What are you doing in here getting drunk? And you know, I felt about two inches tall after that because I realized, and, and all I could say was, was, you know, I, I hit a bump in the road. You know, I didn't have any, I didn't have, really didn't have any excuse, didn't have anything to say. Um, just because I knew, um, I, cause I knew, you know, I, I knew better and, and it's, it's not so much, it's not just the alcohol, but it's, it's our culture, you know, if you're overseas, you're in France or Spain or Italy, a lot of these places, everybody drinks wine with their meals. So what, you know, but because it's a culture thing, but it's different over here. And, um, you know, when, when, in, you know, Paul says, I'll be all things to all men. So if I need to be, if I need to be a certain way in this culture, the culture that I live in to communicate the love of God to people, then that's what I need to do. Right. So. You know, when I was uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, w when I was a young Christian, like, um, and then I I would get tempted, and then, and then I I would reason to myself, oh, that Christian did it, so I can do it too, right? And then I do the same thing, and uh, I I've got what I did, but but I, I remember, you know, I reasoned to myself, oh, that that guy, he's a longer christian than i than i i've been he, he does it so I, I can do that too when i was tempted you know when i was a young christian right. so it, it does it does count you know yeah. how, how you live your life <clears throat> the other people all right it's hi, moving. Sir. hi it's cookie oh hi Joanna. Joanna. Welcome, Joanna. hey there aloha, aloha. hi grady all righty, let's move on. Yeah, yeah, Divine yeah. nature. So when walking in the fear of the Lord, we trust in and embrace the word of God, which enables us to become partners, partakers of the divine nature or partakers of God himself. Now remember that the letter kills what the spirit brings life. The word of God must be taken in context and viewed or heard through the lens of the spirit. I just, Thought I needed to put that in there. Um, Grady, can you read uh, Second Peter? Go ahead and read these verses right here. It is divine power has given us everything we need for life 
and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. That through these, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add your faith, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly mm -hmm. kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities and continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. So through the precise and correct knowledge of God, that's what the knowledge is really means, the precise and correct knowledge of God, and the many promises we find in his word, we can become partakers of the divine nature or partakers of God himself. He, we have, he's our inheritance, right? We have inherited him. We have a part to play in this to enjoy the benefits, though. We have to be intentional in adding to our faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. The promise here is that if we possess these qualities and continue to grow in them, they will keep us from being inactive and fruitless in our pursuit of knowing Christ more intimately. Now, if we don't have the fear of God, any fear of God in, in our lives, we're not going to worry about this at all. We're not going to believe the word of God, except what we want to believe, right? And we're not going to make any effort to to um, to grow in the in the faith, right? We're just going to go to um, cruise control and and go to church, you know, every Sunday or every month or whatever, and throw some money in the plate and say that was a good sermon, and and move on, you know, without without growing up in the Lord at all. So it's really important, you know. So that's why I brought this out. Is is that is that is that um, when walking in the fear of the Lord, we will trust in and embrace the word of God. And in the word of God, it's where we find these promises, right? And the consequence uh, or, or uh, promise of, of doing so um, will, will cause us to continue to grow and cause us to be productive in the kingdom of God. Now we're going to be studying, I'm looking ahead a little bit here on divine nature, and I just got a revelation about the divine nature, so we'll see if it gets addressed here. Maybe not. If we're getting close to it. Let, let's share it. Pastor, we, I, I, let's will, share. I, will, I will share it, but I wanted to see if we would read it first. And so, the, so, so my question here is, how do we partake of the divine nature? You... Um, all those uh, virtues are like, I, I never think about them. I, I, my way, I don't know if it's right or wrong. I just want to read the word to renew my mind, put on Christ, and then, uh, um, you know, yeah, study the word, learn the word, um, fellowship, all those things have helped me to renew my mind. Because the word said, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? So I, really, I, I never think about all these virtues. I don't even know what, what, what some of them means. I just try to renew my mind, try to put on Christ, grow that way. I don't know. It's not the right way to do it. Or... Well, I think as, as, you know, as we grow an understanding of the word and uh, of God's heart and of his will for our lives this stuff just comes along mm -hmm. we're walking in the spirit this stuff will come along and we'll embrace it yeah right but if we if we reject self-control say i'm going to do my own thing 
right? Yeah. Then it's a different story. If we reject, if we think that we already know it all and then nobody can teach us anymore, we'll never, you know, of course, you can't do that and walk in the spirit at the same time. Yeah. So the question was, how do we partake of the divine nature? See God. Okay. By tuned into his word. Yeah. 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 Yeah, get his word and renew renew your mind. All right. So what does it say right here? He says, through these, and he's talking about what we just read up here. Divine power, life, godliness, knowledge of him. Through these, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them, that means by these precious and magnificent promises, we can become partakers of the divine nature. So if we don't know what the word says, if we don't understand the promises of God, if we don't know any of that stuff, then we're going to have trouble walking according to the divine nature walking according to um according to god really right and so if you don't know that it's god's disposition to heal the sick and it's god's disposition for you to to be well um because you don't either don't believe the word or you've never seen it in the word then you're going to have a little trouble walking in that part of the divine nature so it says in uh, Second Peter 1, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So I'm seeing in that verse, it's his divine power that enables me to um, have everything I need for life and godliness the knowledge of him so god's the one that empowers me to to be those things not my own striving or my own strength because i'm i'm not the source of goodness god is the source of goodness and so the um revelation i got was the i've had this desire lately to meditate and study about god's character and his goodness and his divine nature. And the Lord showed me as I've been looking into his heart and looking at that and learning about him and his goodness and his character, it has been rubbing off on me. And so it wasn't anything that I was making happen, but because I was learning, it says in that scripture about the knowledge it says, uh, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So I'm learning about his character. And while I'm diving into that, it's rubbing off on me. And the reason I know that is because of the comments I've been getting from people lately. And what, you know, they don't even know each other or what each other, what the other one has said, but I'm hearing it from people here and there. And they're seeing something in me, in, in the spirit. And they're seeing more, more of God and more wisdom coming out of my mouth. And, and I think it's because I'm studying God's heart and his character and his divine nature and and um, I'm eating, I'm eating that, meditating on that goodness of him. But he says that we're one with Christ and Christ is in us. And that as Christ was, as Christ is, so are we in the world. And so um, when, uh, when people see us, we want them to see the Father. You know, and there was a, a place in the Bible where they, they said that they spent some time with some men and they could tell he'd been with Jesus. You know, Peter they could tell that they'd been hanging out with Jesus because he got Jesus' divine nature on them. Amen. So Amen. it's through that deep calls unto deep, that deep fellowship and learning uh, who God is and who we are in him 
that it just starts to manifest in our lives. That's a good word. And uh, the word says, uh, as we behold his glory in our mirror, we would change from glory to glory, right? Amen. And uh, yeah, that's that's my highest desire. Like, uh, I want people to see Christ in me. It's the word said, put on Christ and no make no provision for the <clears throat> flesh. We're to put off the old man, put on the new man. How how long did it take for you to uh, change like that? <laughs> to when you study his nature, and then how, uh, how long, people see how long did it take me to change? Yeah, w w people see the change. Years. <laughs> I, I, was hoping you said I don't know how long you heard me talking like that that I've been studying his divine nature just the last couple of months. Right? Us, yeah. yeah. So the last uh, couple of months I've been focusing on that quite a bit. Okay. You know, okay, I think I was when we that. feed on something, an aspect of the Lord, and we just keep feeding on him, you know, he's, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So when we feed on feed on the word of God, feed on certain aspects of the character of God or the nature of God, um, there, there is a coming reward. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So as we're, if all we do is seek the Lord concerning, um, concerning prosperity, then I know we're going to get a lot of faith and understanding and prosperity. But if we really want to know the Lord and to seek him for, for him, yeah. who he is and his love and all that, and we just keep feeding on that and seeking that, which Vicky's been doing um, a lot, then that's going to be her reward. And so it's the stuff that people are seeing, uh, you know, they're, it's like their eyes are being opened uh, to uh, some of the things that's going on in Vicky in the spirit. Um, this is all basically reward or, or evidence of her seeking the Lord. So it's really good for all of us to, to really seek the Lord, just seek yeah. the Lord. And I don't want to do, I, Paul says, I want to know of him and the power Amen. of his resurrection and the fellowship of the sufferings. I want to know the Lord. I want to, Amen. you know, I want to, I want to feel his heartbeat. And I want to know what he what he thinks about things, and I want to understand, you know, I want to understand his ways, and I don't I don't want to just have the hand of the Lord. I don't want to just have, yeah. Yeah. you know, provision. I don't want to just have a house to live in or food to eat, but yeah. I want the Lord. You know, I want to know. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I, yeah. had, I had another little vision of a, a little baby that's cranky and crying and misbehaving and. And goes over to the daddy, and the daddy picks it up and puts the baby on his lap, and he just holds it for a while and cuddles the baby and hugs it and loves it. And the baby just sits there and soaks up love for a while. And after a while, the baby gets down, and the baby's heart is full, and it's happy, and it runs around, and it's hugging people, and it's sharing its toys, and and I think that's how it is. We just got to spend time with our daddy and get our love tanks filled back up. And then we've got, you know, love to give. Amen. Amen. The, and the word says, seek his face always in Psalms, right? Seek his face always. Yes. We seek him, all these things be added unto us, not not the things. Seek so, uh, the kingdom of God yeah. and his righteousness and yeah. all these things, all these things that we need will be added unto us, right? Yeah, and as you were saying, Pastor Keith, like we seek his face, not his hand. A lot of people like at church, they seek his hand. Yeah. Lord bless me, do this for me, bless me. But they don't, they don't seek his face, they don't seek his will. They only seek his hand, what he can do for them. So the beginning of all that the Lord has for us to walk in, the beginning of it is the reverential awe and terror of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. There is so much more on this subject as we've just scratched the surface, right? We've just looked at a few verses, just barely scratched the surface. But I think we've covered enough here to give each of us reason to meditate on the importance of the fear of the Lord. You know, I think we've covered enough territory today that that through throughout the days to come, that the fear of the Lord will come to mind and we'll meditate on that, think about it. 
and evaluate, I guess I could say, where we're at. Lord, am I walking in the fear of the Lord or am I being, am I just being nonchalant and, uh, and just cruising along, you know, without a thought. So um, anyway, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And as much as we are willing, he will open the word up to us and continue to show us great and wonderful things. And he will cause us to know him better every day. He's not going to force us, force that on us. He's not going to twist our arm. But as much as we're willing, we spend time with God. We spend time fellowship in the Holy Spirit. We spend time in the word and having the Holy Spirit teach us. Then uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to understand God more and more. We're going to appreciate God more and more. He will blow our minds sometimes with revelations that we go, wow, I never knew that. You know, all of a sudden he'll show us how, you know, we will be reading through the parables and all of a sudden he'll show us some spiritual truths out of the parables that seem just like agricultural principles. And all of a sudden we go, like, I get it. I get it. I get it. All right. So next week, I expect we'll do a brief review of the fear of the Lord. And then move on to the next power word in this series, which is repentance. Repentance yeah. is, you know, you don't know, hear too many churches talking about repentance, the need of repentance. But what, what, did, what did Peter say when the people said, Lord, uh, or was it the jailer, Paul, what must I do to be saved? He said, repent, right? Repent. Repent and turn to God. So, um, Without any, without repentance, uh, our salvation is really questionable. Uh, Todd, can you go ahead and read this last prayer for us, and then I'll stop sharing, stop recording, and we can just visit. Third John. Yep. Verse, uh, chapter one, verse two. Beloved friends, I pray that you are prospering in every way and that you continually enjoy good health just as your soul is prospering. Amen. 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 Amen.